Good morning. Good morning. Hey, Robert. How are you? How are you, Jim? All right. Give everyone the usual five minutes. <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm actually trying to see if I can update the meeting invite now. Oh. We can finally fix the. I thought that I thought that the YAML would produce. I don't know. Now that I think about it, I don't know how it would, but I was under the illusion that it would all sort itself out. But I guess. <laughs> Unfortunately, not. Um, yeah, it seems like it's still. It's letting me um, only change my local version. So I don't know if we have to figure out how to change. So oh, maybe once we get the Zoom account, then we can change the shared version. Well, yeah, well, definitely. I mean, once, once I don't know, again, if we're getting a, a separate account or if they just add us to the existing Kubernetes account, but uh, whenever yeah, I'm not we sure get- Yeah, if you read the link I- Oh. but yeah it's it is a um, separate account which would make sense because that's how they were we can manage recordings and things like that right so we just sign up for it under one of our personal emails is that how that works um whatever email you're using for cncf and no actually they recommend right. using the alias for the leads right so as long as we sign up with that we should be fine the alias for the lead. Anyway, folks are starting to join. <laughs> we can we can chat offline. Yeah, so maybe if you want to just read through the uh, the link, uh, it has all of the details. Yep, yep, we'll do. All right, we'll give uh, give a few more minutes for the early birds to rise. On the West Coast. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, at least. I see we have Anushka, Martin J, and Dan. Hey, everyone. Hi, Jim. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hi, Jim. How are you? Hello. Doing good. How's everyone? Good. Fantastic. Great. How are you? I'm great. Doing great. Uh, so graduated from LFX Spring Mentorship Program, and this week I've published my blog on that. So definitely love to share with the community here as well today, that blog, so that you all can have a feedback of it and help me get better there. Yeah, no, that, the blog looked great. Uh, nice job on that. Uh, Thank you. So, is are you going to publish it on the CNCF site as well, or yeah. will it be? I, I asked uh, to Ehor, uh, as you suggested. So he said that uh, the the form that we that the form that CNCF sent, you have to share the link there. So I've already okay. shared the blog link there. So it's awesome. it's up to CNCF when, when they will be publishing that. Yeah. Sounds good. All right, well, should we get started, Jim? And then I'm sure others will, will trickle in. Okay, uh, do you want to drive, Robert, or should I share and pull up the agenda? Uh, if you can share, I'm happy to at least get the ball rolling. Um, All right, let me do that. Oh, and I see messages flying up. <laughs> oh, there we go. Yeah, so uh, I, I, see, I see Dan has joined. Thank you, Dan. I thought we'd uh, uh, discuss some of the supply chain topics that have been going round and round in the various circles, both CNCF and Kubernetes, Linux Foundation. And uh, Dan had, had, I think, correct me if I misstate things, Dan, but you, you had authored a blog post from the Google team around the, the initiatives you guys are engaged in, the Tecton CD project and Tecton Chains. Um, but it, uh, I thought maybe we'd, we'd kick off a conversation around the topic of supply chain and, and the SBOM initiative that's going on in Kubernetes and, and maybe get your perspective on things. Sure. 
Um, yeah, where do you want to start? So I've been involved in that stuff. There's also SBOM here, I see, which is kind of tangentially related, um, which we can talk about that I've also been involved in. Um, I see SBOM and supply chain metadata as kind of overlapping Venn diagrams. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it might be helpful if someone who's kind of immersed in, in the whole subject matter, maybe give us your landscape view of, of where we should kind of parcel out these topics so that as we approach it from a policy perspective, what are, how would you categorize the, the, the higher priorities? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. And policy is such a deep space and broad topic. Um, yeah, I think, you know, there's the SBOM stuff is kind of being mostly driven by, I guess I would say the you know, US government and the recent executive order around requiring people to supply SBOMs with artifacts that they deliver. Um, are people familiar with that at all? It's kind of... I, I am at a, at a high level. Uh, okay. I haven't, I haven't used SPDX or whatever the, the format is or the tools yet. Sure. Yeah, we'll, we'll start there, I guess. Yeah, so there's um, there's been a push from both NIST, the US, which is the US government, National Institute for Standards and Technology, and then the NTIA, uh, National, I don't know what it stands for, um, another group to start talking about like whether or not people you know, shipping software should have to ship S bombs, and then what fields should have to be in those software bill of materials in order to do useful things with them. So over the past couple of weeks, there's been a huge public comment period and stuff like that. There are a bunch of different use cases around what people want to do with data for a software bill of materials, which makes it kind of hard to talk about abstractly. Um, I think the biggest one, at least personally for me, um, is giving people that use an artifact the ability to respond quickly and on their own to security alerts for that artifact. So at a high level, you can imagine Finesse Bomb contains enough information for you to set up alerts on like a CVE database, like NVD or one of the other vendors, then I think that it is good enough. Um, in a lot of cases, this can be done with kind of like post hoc binary analysis and scanning a container and looking for what you find, but that's kind of lossy. In a lot of cases, like you're looking and hoping that the configuration is set up correctly and that people haven't rebuilt things themselves and not included all this configuration. So SBOMs are kind of a way for build systems to propagate more high fidelity information through on the way, if that makes sense. Um, and then policy around that today is kind of just limited to like, is there one or not? Um, uh, and go ahead. No, I was just laughing. That was kind of my take when I looked at this at first. Yeah, it's 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 tough because to generate one with good information inside of it, it kind of has to be done by the build system. You can always scan stuff after the fact and get some information, but because it's done that way, it means you kind of just have to trust that it has the correct information. Um, if you could actually just crack something open and see what's inside of it correctly, then you wouldn't need this SBOM to begin with, because you just have all the information and you can crack it open and scan it and find all the correct stuff. So it's kind of a shift in thought process here, which a lot of people I think are struggling to, to deal with. You've got this thing that you don't actually know if it's correct, but it might have more useful information in it than the thing that you can actually you know hold with your hands and know is correct, but might not have all the information inside of it. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of tough to write policy around something when you can't prove it's correct, um, but it's, yeah. It's tough. <laughs> um, yeah, and for Kubernetes clusters, Dan, it seems like you know there's the two options uh, that are um, in, in play today are either at admission controls or, of course, through background scanning and periodic scanning. So, any thoughts on what would be and both you know seem legit in terms of applying or checking some of this? A any other thoughts on what could be done for? defining and managing policies for things like a bill of materials? Yeah, um, yeah, again, for like what's inside the bill of materials, I think it's kind of tough because there's just no real understanding of what's supposed to go inside of them yet. I think, you know, the formats are all relatively simple. There's SPDX has kind of a more complicated tag value thing, but there's also just JSON versions of all of these and easy ways to convert between them. So I think it would align pretty well with existing tools like OPA and stuff or anything that can kind of parse JSON and write complex rules. If you knew what you were looking for, that's kind of the bigger thing. Um, I don't think okay. people know what type of policy they would want to apply to the contents of an SBOM today. Um, the other, the, the bigger thing would just be like, is there one and maybe was it produced by someone that I trust? 
Um, and that comes down to like how S bombs get cryptographically signed and things like that. So I think the existing policy tools would be okay um, for that, at least for you know S bombs as currently described. Um, there are tons of open questions around where they get stored, how they get copied around with containers and everything like that. Um, that's also still in flight. I'd actually be kind of curious to flip this around a little bit. Are there policy questions you know that people are asking that we can't answer today? I mean, the, I think a lot of you captured some of the discussions that are happening um, around use case and, you know, how are they going to use it, how they're going to consume it. And right now, the only questions that I am hearing are in these kind of government or, or government related projects where it's, you know, does it exist mm -hmm. or not? And then, mm -hmm. you know, maybe they'll get pedantic down to the level of, you know, how is the trust chain built and, you know, how can we check, you know, it's like any certificate, right? Like, who issued the, who signed it? Who issued the cert to sign it? Who's, who manages those keys? How are those keys managed? And, you know, that kind of level of questioning. Um, so I can imagine policies derived from those high level, simple questions around, you know, existence of this, of the metadata that we expect for the signature is there. It has, you know, all of these uh, components. Maybe there's a whitelist, blacklist approach to that policy. So, you know, mm -hmm. if I see if I see a S bomb with these components, deny, you know, deployment or build or whatever, something like that. Yeah, I think it would kind of that comes down again. The only thing I can really think of that would be useful and practical is like denying if there are vulnerabilities known in something, um, which requires joining the S bomb data against something else. So it's a little bit tricky. Like you wouldn't include vulnerability data in an S bomb because it's dynamic, right? A vulnerability might not exist today, but it might right. exist tomorrow where the software hasn't changed. So instead, you kind of need to grab the identifiers out of the S bomb, which is a challenge, um, and then query against some database and do policy that way. It also like, you know, it's a hard policy decision to make timing wise, because again, the same question, when you deployed something, it might have met policy, but now tomorrow the pod is still running, but it doesn't meet policy. And there's a tough question about what to even do in that case, you don't want to take something down necessarily just because now there's a medium CV in it, that's even worse than letting leaving it run, but coming up with a quick plan to remediate. Well, um, that's, so. that's, <laughs> um, that, that is, I mean, that kind of human level decision on like human policy, like what, right. you know, you, you may, if you're, if you're, you know, a government agency, you may have a policy that says, and, and this is very common, you know, all vulnerabilities have to be remediated based on a particular categorization by say 90 days. Right. Yeah. And if you don't, you have to turn it off. <laughs> right. So you, sure, you, may yeah. in fact, you may in fact get someone that says, nope. I want you to turn down, turn off my cluster if if I've got a medium vulnerability that's been around for more than ninety days. So yeah, no, that's that's completely fair too. Um, yeah, probably not. Yeah, you wouldn't want to do it like the minute it's found. Probably, maybe you would. Um, maybe not. Um, depending on, I guess, your use case. But yeah, I think something like that SLO is much more common. We do stuff like that too internally at Google. We call it like Build Horizon or something like that. There's just a blanket rule, not even tied to build or to CVEs that. You have to rebuild and redeploy things every X days, um, no matter what, um, just to prove you can, to prove there's still somebody there that can do the rebuild um, and to you know ensure that people care about it. Yeah, I mean, I think down, you know, downstream, you know, once, if, if this mm -hmm. does pick up steam and mm -hmm. people do start experimenting with finding cases, I think that, you know, I think there's enough downstream tooling. So there's projects like Cloud Custodian and, and others that you know can you know take a, either a, an agent or a you know lambda running background cron task approach and just continually you know check things are there you know check the, the manifest see if there's packages that you know have been flagged from some other database so there's got operators that can run to combine data sources uh, I, I guess that's probably the the main idea around second order use cases I think right now maybe next 12 months it's just Someone on the government side asked for this to the, to sign the contract, so it better be there, <laughs> yeah. and that gets us to the next twelve months. But after that, I could see the down downstream tooling doing a little bit more nuanced checking and enforcement and remediation. Makes sense. Uh, this is Jay. I just wanted to chime in with my thoughts on this. Right, um, I think the way I think about this is. Uh, 
we need to apply the policy-based governance uh, through the entire life cycle, right? Development, deployment, and runtime. And the more we can um, shift left and discover things early on, the better, right? So, so the question is, uh, so from my perspective, when I talk about policies, what I'm talking about is to ensure that during the development phase, you know, we are scanning for vulnerabilities. Uh, if there are artifacts we are signing, the signing policies are in place and uh, you know those kinds of things right so ensuring that that is there in the pipelines uh, how do we i know we have technologies uh six store and others to sign you know things like that right but question is how do you ensure that those things are in place they are operating as expected they are configured properly i think that's where i i feel policies come into play right um from my perspective at least and um, one of my colleagues um, in ibm research is working on um uh, policies along for the secure supply chain. Um, Shripath, he's not able to join today, but I was just actually pinging him on the background to tell him, you know, that uh, this topic's being discussed today. He's going to listen to the recording. But uh, so that those are really my thoughts, right? So how do we uh, get those uh, kind of policies in the pipeline? Yeah, it's there are a couple of different point of views too that I've seen people take around the policy. Like, is policy artifact centric? Um, is it operation centric around like locking down who can make changes and when and what should go in those changes, or is it around you know only certain artifacts are allowed? Um, and you know they kind of have different um, implications too on the rest of things. I think Kubernetes has a pretty good handle on the policy around who can make changes and what type of changes can be made using existing things like RBAC and most other policy engines. Um, but it's kind of the, the more artifact centric ones where you know you have a 26 character long container name and then a giant hash at the end where you start to lose fidelity around where that came from and to trace it back to the sources and change management history on all the things that went into the binary. Does that make any sense? Yes, yes. And I think right now we just have a lack of tooling in general to even have high quality data around what went into those things that you could even start to make policy decisions around. Yeah. Yeah, I think part of the thing is to kind of design it so that that kind of configuration is exposed, right? Um, then you can start building policies to manage that, right? Yeah, yeah it's, it's getting that data exposed. It's getting that data trustworthy using things like Six store and other cryptographic signing tools, and then making sure that it's generated in a trustworthy manner from build systems um, that you trust or people that you trust, and then you can start to um, make decisions based on it. So this is this is Anka. Uh, so Jaya, I'm working closely with with uh, uh, Shripad uh, to actually bring the shift left into the you know the CI/CD uh, uh, policies. Uh, integration into the IBM Cloud uh, security and compliance platform. So I know exactly what you know, what what is done there, um, and how you know the evidence is signed and and so on. But I, I, I'm just not sure how much of that can be discussed here because we are not. Some of this is in the open space, some is not. So um, if if you are aware of what is in the open space and you can tell me, I can provide details. But otherwise, I think. Uh, I would like to to first take it back to the team to see you know where we are. Yeah, that'll be that'll be nice, right? Uh, to come back to this forum and um, whatever can be shared, the share would be. Would yeah, be we have we have a full solution uh, that uh, takes uh, you know different types of pipelines, right? So whether it is a, um, a pipeline to deploy. Uh, OpenShift, or it's a pipeline to deploy an application on OpenShift, or whether it's a pipeline to deploy infrastructure as code, it's a very different set of uh, checks of policies and the way that we collect the data. So we have a solution that does that for the, the three different types with signed artifacts and is using OSCAL to align everything on the same standard from a posture point of view, and we push it to the uh, security center. And there we are able through the uh, CD IDs uh, 
of the resource instances that the CD deploys to correlate the shift left posture with the shift right, with the, with the runtime um, posture of the same resource instances, uh, right? So that's the, the, the solution is there. I try to, to understand how much that would be relevant in the context of what we are doing with, with Kubernetes, right? Because this is already deployed. Um, is, this, is this discussion, and I'm sorry, I joined a bit late then, is this discussion like looking for a you know a partnership with with um, the supply chain or is something that we want to bring into the working group? What, what is the overall goal? That's a good I think question. The, oh, I think the, the goal is simply uh, just exploratory in that um, Dan and the and the folks at Google you know seem to be leading uh, at least the a leading voice in the community around how they're tackling supply chain security obviously there's a there's a, a lot of buzz and, and kind of organizational attention on software bill of materials which is as dan mentioned you know a, a part of the whole problem but not the entirety um and then I, I i was actually hoping dan if you wanted to say a few words about the tecton project or, or chain specifically and how you think you know sure. whether any, all of that fits in or if it's orthogonal or or because we are kind of trying to map out the holistic view of cloud native policy and all the different parts. So I thought Tecton definitely has a place there. Yeah, so the way I've been looking at it is in, in you know, in Tecton chains and kind of what that blog post led to and how we got here before we got sidetracked with SPOMs a little bit um, is Tecton chains basically to be able to capture you know, as much useful, verifiable, correct metadata about what happened during a build process. Um, you know, this is all running within a Kubernetes cluster. Uh, but so when you kick off a build, you know, it's a series of containers that run in order. I mean, we want to know exactly what happened there. So which container digests were pulled, which entry points were run in those containers, that kind of thing. Um, and then do that in a way that's secure. So if a compromised build step um, happens, it can't tamper with this data that we've observed or, you know, from somewhere else in a separate trust boundary. And then getting that data somewhere, um, you know, cryptographically signing it, putting it somewhere tamper proof, and then making it useful later to policy engines. So I kind of draw our line right at where you know this group starts. Um, I want to get all the useful data in a secure, verifiable manner um, to whatever policy engines people want. Um, if that makes sense. It does. Yeah. <laughs> does there need to be? Um, so we we in this group we've defined a custom resource for policy output? Does it need to be kind of prime the pump? Does it need to be some sort of definition of that, what you guys are producing that we can consume into a policy engine? Or is that is that going to be bespoke for each type of policy engine, you think? Um, I think I think a lot of that can be artifact centric. Like I think just like signatures and you know metadata around artifacts is sort of today. Um, it's pretty artifact centric. Like if you're talking about jars and you know the Java world, there's well-known places inside of the jar, you know, to put this type of metadata. Um, with containers, we're kind of lacking that today, but there is some movement happening in the OCI, which is the group that kind of oversees the open containers initiative and the specifications there. So there could be ways to start attaching all of this data to a container in a useful way so it can be consumed by a policy engine. Um, I would hope that it's not bespoke to each policy engine. I would hope that it's standardized for each type of artifact you want to apply policy on. Um, we're just not quite there yet. Does that make any sense? Yeah, so in other words, it's, it's they're self-describing. So just an introspection task rather than you know some sort of metadata that's published uh, separate from the... Yeah, and, and yeah, it doesn't necessarily need to be completely self-describing. We just need a, a way to go from like, hey, here's a container I have. What is all the information about it? It could be in it. It could be next to it. As long as there's like a well-known way to discover it. Um, there's a lot of weird cases where like, you know, if you want to sign a container, you can't modify the container to stick the signature inside because then the digest changes, you know, invalidating signatures and all sorts of weird <laughs> stuff like that. So it's, um, yeah, other, you know, jars work around that just by like signing some inner contents of the jar, but that doesn't really work in the container world. So, right. it's, um, yeah, it, there has to be a well-known useful mechanism to provide that data to the policy engine. I had a like super pedantic question mm -hmm. around that, you know, trust and you know, that kind of rooting all that trust. Is there any kind of roadmap around 
working in an enclave environment? Are you, if you're familiar with like kind of the Intel FGX <laughs> enclaves and stuff? Yeah, it's, I've done almost no work there. I have almost no understanding other than it's a thing. Um, uh, I, I, you know, I've just from reading Twitter and Hacker News comments, it appears that, you know, a lot of the CPU issues we've had over the last year on side channel attacks kind of weaken a lot of the promises that enclaves um, can do, but I'm really not an expert. That's just my, if you ask me about it on the street, that's my current take based on what I've happened to scroll through. Um, I think you could do a lot of really awesome things uh, if enclaves were a thing that you could, you know, that worked the way they were described. That makes sense. You'll hear no more about them than I do. <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't want to hijack the topic. I, I was, yeah. uh, I think there is, you know, there's no perfect solution. There's obviously there's, there's timing attacks and various things at the CPU and cache levels that are going to undermine, you know, pretty much anything. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's kind of that more that, you know, layers upon layers of uh, weaker security. Does that add up to, to good security? I don't know. <laughs> Pro provably no, but you know, practically maybe. That's tough. Cool. So there are some, I know Robert do uh, for supply chain and others, um, a few of us are part of some Slack channels on the CNCF uh, side, right? And um, so there's, Definitely some other activity and perhaps uh, Dan, if there's some thoughts or ideas for how we can collaborate on the policy side, let us know. Yeah, um, I guess, I mean, the most useful thing to me for me would just be to start hearing feedback on the type of policies, you know, as, as concrete as you can get. And I know it's tough because it's this like chicken and egg thing where nobody has the data they want to apply policy on. So they're not thinking too much about what they want to do. Um, but if you could kind of wave a magic wand, assume you had all of the secure, trustable data in the world, you know, going all the way back to the compiler that compiled your compiler, um, what type of policy would you want to write? And then we can think through the right ways to capture that data, chain it together, query it, and all of that stuff. Okay. Um, that would be good. super useful to me. And then I can, I, I can figure out how to get you that data. <laughs> So um, I'm going to just volunteer uh, <laughs> Anka here. Um, so Anka, could you please sync up with uh, Sripad and uh, see you know what we can um, come here and talk about, right? Based on our experience. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. Awesome. Thank you. And by the way, congrats on the root key signing. I think that was last oh, week, right? Uh, yeah, that was fun very on Friday. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> Hopefully, we can help out uh, the Kubernetes project start signing things too soon. Oh, so you were on the SIG store? Is that, is that what we're talking about? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Awesome. Well, yeah, I appreciate that. I, I mean, we're definitely trying to map all these pieces and <laughs> fill in all the puzzle pieces for the. The whole end-to-end, -end, I mean, it's ambitious, <laughs> maybe maybe overly. Um, so appreciate having someone come in and help us uh, get uh, visibility on this. Cool. Awesome. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Anything else for today? Or? Well, uh, I think we have a few logistical, and uh, we're, we, like I said, we are putting together this white paper. You're certainly welcome to join, but... Uh, <laughs> I definitely understand if you've got uh, a busy schedule, feel free to drop off. <laughs> all right. Thanks. I think I'll drop you. I'll know how to find me if you want to. All right. Absolutely. Thanks, Dan. Thanks, Dan. Thank okay. Uh, then Zoom accounts is obviously a good logistic thing to fix, so we can get these recordings. <laughs> all right. <laughs> Yeah, so I logged a couple of GitHub issues. Robert, let me know if you want me to follow. One of us can go ahead and request a Zoom account. I think that's the next I'll, thing to I'll, do. I'll, and... I'll take one more bite at the apple. I, I tried on the YouTube front. I okay. had read what I had found previous about getting all this, and it seemed to be um, ambiguous, at least to me. But maybe there's some new clarity in the link you posted. So I'll, I'll take a look. I'll, I'll try one more time. If, if I fail, I'll, I'll fall on my sword and maybe ask for your help yeah just reach out we can let's uh, yeah we can get this sorted out okay um other things so on the white paper yeah one of the things we've been discussing is uh i think there's a general consensus that we need to carve out some time and maybe schedule some additional sessions to to get going 
I know Jaya has done some submissions on GitHub and then a few comments and other things pending, but maybe just to kick things off, uh, we need a few more working sessions. So there is a project board which lists out all of the at least major areas we had identified. Um, and you know, most of for most of them, folks have uh, you know volunteered for different sections. Um, but then the next thing to do is I created this doodle to just see what meeting times we can schedule. And I'm thinking starting next week, and uh, it will be good to make sure that if we sign up for you know authoring, we have at least a couple of hours uh, per week. I would say for the next three to four weeks. Um, and beyond that, once we get through the basic content, it'll just be editing and reviewing and things like that. But the next few weeks would be critical if we want to kind of kick this off. So for folks, um, you know, who wanted to kind of uh, work on authoring some of these sections, just make sure that we have the right time commitments and can put in that. There will be other, you know, like I know, uh, Anka, we had talked about the OSCAL mapping and things like that. Uh, I'm thinking that would come a little bit later once we hash out the you know the main structure of the paper, uh, and those type of things we'll we'll file more tasks for and uh, other things for uh, after we get the uh, the basic content in. I have I have the content, uh, uh, Jim. It's just a question of finding time to right. go through the process. Maybe I'll work. It's very busy, you know, June and, you know, before leaving for vacation and so on to wrap up things. Sure. Uh, to try to work with Jaya, maybe I will get yeah. your help, Jaya, on how to go through the loops of getting from content to actual, you know, submission in, in PR or Git. I don't know what is the, the process. Sure. Or if yeah, you don't have time, Jaya, if you know someone in your team that, uh, that could help so that, uh, you know, yeah, yeah, we can, we can, uh, it's like you. We can, uh, Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah and then that, you know, the, the logist, I guess the details of the process, we can keep lightweight. So even if you have your stuff in a Google Docker things, it's, you know, pretty straightforward to convert it to Markdown when we want to, basically we can just copy paste it and format it, right? But anyways, I think as a next step, so I know Robert, Jaya, uh, Raj, I don't think is on the, Call today, but he had, you know, expressed interest in this, uh, and Aradna had also expressed interest in, you know, authoring some of the sections. So if you could all just select some available times uh, for the next few weeks, uh, and we'll pick at least one hour. Uh, so what I'm thinking is we'll we, we'll meet like an hour a week in addition um, to any working time we need independently, um, and that way we can sync up and make some quicker progress on this. And Jim, just to clarify on timing, is the goal, and I think it maybe should be as a forcing function, is the goal to have something that's kind of presentable by the time we get to the, the KubeCon sessions? So KubeCon is in October. So yeah, we have some room till then. Uh, it would be good to get the paper published uh, yeah, earlier. And if we can time it with that, I think that, that will work out great. So we uh, have the paper out. We can even do a blog post and things around the paper. Uh, and then of course, uh, that could be one of the ways of uh, for content or the topic or the uh, discussion at KubeCon itself. Yeah, so I guess, you know, the answer is yes, but I don't know if we can, uh, yeah. So October seems like a long time uh, from now, but I'm sure it'll yeah, come really. quickly, right? <laughs> <laughs> yes. So yeah, maybe that's a good target we can work towards. Yeah, I, I, and I, I don't, I don't want to give us too much rope to hang ourselves by, but I think realistically, if you if you back it up from October and you know having a polished document that's been reviewed and is presentable and writing up kind of the panel uh, discussion about that and you know getting you know talking to uh -huh. Amy and folks at CNCF and going just going back and back and back and back, you like we're definitely not too far ahead of the curve <laughs> we're, we're very very yeah, much good point maybe we're maybe we don't have enough time um I yeah know, so I think, I think we're right on the curve i think we're not too far jim, behind not too far ahead so jim uh wednesday's uh 2 p.m pacific time were great for me i don't know about the others um 
Yes, I, you know, maybe, um, and we could do this now, or if uh, folks want to just go to the link, I can share that and at least uh, then just indicate okay. your preferred time um, uh, on this and, you know, just select a couple of options that, that are available and then we'll, we'll see what works for everyone. Yeah, okay. Apologies, I, I, I'm enthusiastic uh, about doing the sessions. Unfortunately, next week I am traveling. I'll be out of town. I'll be async, so I'll be, but I'll be in a weird time zone. So okay, I, I will try to jump on, but if it doesn't work, I'll definitely asynchronously uh, sure. do, the, do the hour. <laughs> yeah, and the idea is this is more to pick the day and um, time within the week, and right, we'll do it recurring for at least like three or four weeks just to get things started. Exactly. So just pick whatever time, and I offered a few options within the day. If you want to add more options, let me know. Uh, we'll see what we can make work. But I think, um, yeah, there's some afternoon time. And Friday was the only open morning I have left. So uh, that's uh, why I put a couple of morning times on Friday. But other than that, it seems like afternoons, midday works best, specific time, which would be evening or early afternoon, Eastern time. And do you have the link for the Doodle in uh, in the docs? It's in the chat and in the docs. Okay. And I think Anka for the OSCAL section, I, like you said, you can probably coordinate with Jaya. That may work best. Uh, you don't have to be in every session unless you want to, right? So it's up to you based on your schedule. Uh, if you want to work on other sections, of course, feel free to. And um, we can then then yeah, you might need more time commitment. Yeah, I think I have the OSCAL part, and it was another one, use cases, I think, or I don't, uh, let me see my. Uh... Okay, yeah, and there, like, again, for any of these, just, uh, you know, make sure in GitHub, then you can also kind of add yourself to the issue. So we'll track everything through GitHub. So I think um, here, yeah, for this use cases right now, I think we had Robert and Aradna who had um, also signed up. So then it would be- Oh no, it was the mappings. I found it. It was the mappings. On, there is a part right. on the compliance mappings that brings okay. Oscal as well. Right, um, so Oscal would fit in there, you're right. Oscal will fit in there. And then it was an ah, end use cases, exactly, yes. Okay, so just uh, through GitHub, make sure you you know kind of tag yourself in whichever issues you're interested in, so you'll receive notifications, yeah. and then coordinate with others who are working on that section. Um, so you know, as long as uh, one of the folks working on that section is in the meetings in the next few weeks, uh, we can start making progress. I, I, I think that's me, you. Anka. <laughs> you and I can connect uh, offline. Sounds good. I uh, sorry to interrupt. Uh, if you suggest, then I I can also try to volunteer and policy report to working group for white white paper meetings. So if you suggest, even I can try to volunteer whenever you suggest. Sure. Yeah. No. You're absolutely welcome to. I think uh, initially we want to just get a lot of the content written up uh, by a few folks, but then um, and it will take some time commitment. Uh, you know, in terms of these various subject matters. But then it, we will have other sessions where for review and for other things, and we'll have to keep widening the circle, right? So, but feel free to sign up, you know, for areas where you feel you kind of want to contribute. So just look at the open issues and see what Definitely. makes sense. Definitely. Definitely. Thank you. Yeah, and, and curating any, you know, uh, supplemental information or supporting materials that anyone comes across and, you know, we can, right. it doesn't have to be a GitHub issue, it can be in the, the Google Doc, but, you know, dumping links or articles or things that folks think we should have eyes on, that's always helpful, at least I, I find it helpful. Yeah, like the, just the stuff we just discussed right, with SBOM and other things that could be new, uh, there's always, you know, new things to bring in. All right, cool. So that's on the white paper. Any, any other thoughts, comments, suggestions on what we do there?
Okay. Um, so then we can, you know, switch to uh, just some quick project updates uh, on uh, ongoing activities. Hi Anushka. everyone. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. So I am working on a project with Jim that uh, involves building a Falco adapter that will take outputs from Falco and generate or update a policy report. So uh, to give a quick update on what all happened in the last two weeks ever since our last meeting, we decided to work with Falco Psychic to get outputs. We finalized the mapping document after talking to a couple of other members from the community, Gus and Thomas and Frank. Um, we worked on the, uh, we have started working on a design document uh, that would give us a concrete way to uh, move on with here on. Then we have understood and implemented uh, how uh, you know Falco psychic outputs uh, can be taken in a code, and uh, we have got that via Falco psychic web UI by enabling events. Uh, we have in the code unmarshaled the JSON output and got it in Go variables to manipulate them. And uh, yes, finally, I have I had some issues with uh, running Falco on my system today for some reason, but I have a short uh, screen recording of how the outputs look and how Falco um, Psychic Web UI looks. So maybe if I could share screen. Yes, I can. So I'll just show that to you quickly. Um, I hope my screen is visible. Yep. So this is how the web UI looks. And um, from here, we have just, uh, we just wanted to see how events uh, would look. This is a JSON format. And um, yes, that's with that. For uh, how our code looks, this. So this is just to see how my outputs uh, come out. Uh, in coding wise, I did try uh, mapping these outputs with CRD and I wasn't able to test it because I was not able to get Falco running on my system, but right. But otherwise that's, uh, that's all. I think that's all for Falco Adapter. Thank you. Thanks, yeah. Uh, that's great progress. Uh, okay, yeah, I don't think Stephen is on the call today, but just a quick uh, recap on some of the work we've been doing there. So um, the main task was to investigate Trivi, Claire, and some other scanners, which, you know, is completed. We are moving forward with Trivi. So there's some early prototyping and work going on there. And also looking at um, how, you know, the, uh, there is uh, the, the, the project Starboard uh, team is using Trivi for internal scans. So one thing Stephen found out is right now, it's really one image at a time. So you kind of have to um, request an image to be scanned. And then Trivi, of course, can scan that image uh, show the vulnerabilities and produce that into an output. So the challenge, uh, or at least something that we need to design and figure out now is how do we, you know, if we want to scan the entire cluster periodically, what's the best way to do that, right? And doesn't seem like there's any good uh, implementation out there or, or, you know, some way of solving this. So we're trying to see, is that something that we need another utility to periodically scan the cluster, collect the list of images, um, and then supply that to Trivi somehow, perhaps through a config map, which would then trigger off you know, a, a background scan on each one of those images. Uh, but that could be a fairly intensive task for large clusters. So uh, need to collect a little bit more data and thoughts on that uh, to see what's the best way to address it. Uh, but anyways, that's where we are. And then the next step, of course, once we figure out that part of the design, uh, the next step would be to um, come up with the mapping from the trivia output 
into the policy report, which seems you know fairly straightforward and possible to do. But uh, so right now we're just more focused on that initial part of gathering the data and the set of images. Okay, any thoughts, questions, feedback on either of those projects? Thanks, Jim. I just wanted to give a quick suggestion to Anushka uh, because I implemented a, a project like that only QBase adopter. So first of all, congratulations, Anushka. Uh, that was really nice uh, JSON output uh, uh, because you have got the variables, so you have almost everything in your hands now. Um, the mapping part is relatively easier once you decide the doc. So I'm sending you that part of the code where I figure it out and hopefully it can help you to get some reference or ins inspiration from there. So uh, great work till now here, Anushka. Thank you. I have read your blog and I, I believe it's the code generator. Uh, understood. Thank you. Thank you, Mrithanja. I'll have a look. Thank you. And oh, thank you for the blog as well. It has helped me so much. No problem. No problem at all. Thank you so much. So Jim, I was... Um... What I was thinking was that uh, some of these scans, right, are, are another thing that we could incorporate in the DevSecOps pipeline, right? And, um, and the policies that we are creating here could be applicable in that. Right, so certainly the, um, you know, the, the intent would be that the images are scanned prior to admission controls, prior to them running in the cluster and there's some way of verifying that, perhaps at admission controls. But then the remaining problem that we had discussed once, and I think Dan also kind of hinted on that, is um, what happens if there's a vulnerability found, you know, after the workload is running, right? So how do you detect that? So either that has to be sort of a periodic scan driven from the cluster, or it's a push from some external system into something in the cluster to say, hey, there's some new updates. So what we were thinking, and maybe this is not the best way to approach the problem, but at least what we're thinking is there needs to be um, a period, like some, maybe it's once a day or it could be even once a week, but at some interval, you would want to scan all the existing workloads uh, and rerun and check if there's any new vulnerabilities for them. Right, I think that's what custodian, for example, would recommend. And do you know like what kind of intervals are recommended typically? And is it a pull or a push or? I, I, think, I think it's mostly a pull. So they're you know scanning based on cron essentially. Um, I don't know what the periodicity is. I mean, it's, it's probably depends on your cluster sizes and you know how many things to scan. If, it, if it's a small cluster, you can probably do it every, five minutes if it's a huge cluster and that scan is going to take an hour you know you probably don't want to do it that often <laughs> right um and then of course you know how how can you operationalize responding to it if you do find issues so if you're getting alerts every hour is anyone it's just going to be uh overload so my guess right. is that a reasonable um something that would pass muster in most enterprises would be kind of a daily scan um and you know that's probably yeah. the, the the fastest anyone can respond anyway right yeah daily scan is good um so what i was thinking was as part of this work right um in addition to producing policy report for the results can we also start working on policies for these tools right so po policy sorry policy for the tools like for Trivi or Falco, you mean, or? Yes, yes, right? So, because really what you want is for a, for a specific security control, you want to make sure that the mm -hmm. plays right. it's done properly, and then the results are getting returned, right? So if you consider all three aspects, right? You want to apply the policy-based governance concept to all three, right? So, so I, and I think that, that will kind of also answer kind of the question that uh, Dan was talking about, which is what are the kinds of policies should be putting in place, right. right? So this would be a policy to even configure like how often should Trivi be running? Right. Is it running, you know, and how do you make sure 
that the scans are happening right in the intended fashion. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, that's an interesting topic, right? Because right now what we're assuming is that it's configured, it's running and, and we're more focused on, okay, here's the output of the uh, right. of that tool itself, right. but something has to make sure that the tool runs, otherwise uh, the policy, yeah, nothing's gonna right. be secure. Well, it's not just running, I think to, to your point, like, you know, how many times have I seen folks right. say, oh, yeah, we're running Falco. And then I look at what Falco is scanning. And it's just like the default out of the box template that's mm -hmm. not scanning anything. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, right. right. So we need to make sure Falco, Falco is running. It is scanning for the right things, right? How often is it scanning? And then the results, right? Right. Yeah, and, and there also, what's the definition of the right thing, right? So how should Falco, how strict should any of these tools be? varies dramatically based on the environment, the type of things you're trying to enforce. Uh, so well, that's some very interesting questions there. As well, well, that's what I think. I think where NIST does a good job, I mean, in highly verbose. I mean, I don't think you need 400 page documents to convey this, but that notion of baselines. So they have, you know, low, moderate, high baselines. Right. Um, you know, something that can be, and, I, and that's essentially where the, um, PSPs went right. They basically said we're going to recommend this kind of baseline for for most people, and if you want to customize it from there, feel free. Um, so I think you, we could put guardrails around. You know, here's here's you know high low. Maybe we have a moderate baseline, and you can tweak it from there. But you know, in low, you know, either it's turned on with with the defaults, or maybe things aren't even turned on. High, it's turned on with very specific configuration checks and and frequency recommendations and then you just kind of tune the knobs and levers from there yeah that's a good good set of ideas and you know some work which would be fairly interesting right because then you could um, for each of these like four or five tools we have identified which map to different areas of policy enforcement uh, we could have some standard profiles, things like that, right? To say, okay, this is what you would typically want to uh, drive to as a baseline or whatever other levels there are. Right. I mean, I think it's it's important practically. To, I mean, like we've republished baselines, everybody will look at it. Some people might even turn it on, but you, you got you to have some operational capacity to deal with the downstream side of it. Um, right. You know, again, like, you know, if you're, if you're doing work in government, you, you find a vulnerability, you can't just sit on it indefinitely. You have a you have a contractual and federal requirement that you have to solve that within 30, 60, 90 days, uh, or else you get, you know, you get a finding and then that gets, you know, elevated to a cap and eventually you, you know, you, you lose your contract. <laughs> so um, similar, similar things probably don't happen in the, in the very, you know, uh, private sector commercial world. But uh, you know the end result is eventually you get ransomware and then everybody starts looking through the forensics of whose fault it is. So <laughs> right. Yeah, good good topics. Um, let's you know I don't know what would be a good next step on it, but certainly we're thinking about as we're you know getting to these set of outputs. Maybe perhaps that's a next level of activity stream or things we start. So Jay, let, let us know if there's folks on your team or others who wanna you know, look at that in more detail. Yeah, uh, Gus uh, from my team here to drop, but uh, he definitely he's involved in the Falco community. So okay. he's definitely looking at uh, policies for Falco. So, so I think, uh, so that'll be at least one one set of security controls, right? Uh, so right. I would like to see whether we can apply this for these other controls as well. Okay, sounds good. All right, so, and then the last topic we had on the agenda was just a quick uh, you know, uh, discussion on KubeCon US, uh, like we talked about when, when we were discussing the white paper, that's in October. Um, and it's gonna be, a hybrid conference, uh, which I don't know exactly how that works, but uh, I think there's a, you know, in-person as well as virtual events. Um, but anyways, we have the, you know, opportunity to propose either a, a presentation or a panel session and uh, just some collecting some quick feedback from Robert and others. Seems like the preference of, and I agree, would be to do a panel session. 
So we can propose uh, something for that. Um, so, you know, on Slack, I'll float some ideas. And um, if we do, you know, perhaps uh, the panel session could be right around what we're, uh, the work we're doing with the white paper. Yep. So that would fit in nicely. And, you know, uh, I think panel sessions are restricted to four, um, four people. So we would have to have one of us would moderate and then we'd have three others or we would just rotate somehow and uh, figure out how to, you know, go over some of the topics. Yeah, I'm happy to volunteer as moderator since I'm not uh, in any way affiliated as a vendor or, or an open source project directly. So that way, uh, Jim, for example, okay. if you want to participate, you're <laughs> no conflict of interest there. <laughs> so happy okay. to happy to happy to volunteer. Um, I guess we don't know if we'll get accepted. Uh, no, we until, don't. Until when? Do you know offhand? Uh, I yeah, I'll okay, can I can pull up the That's calendar. Fine. Not not exactly sure on the dates, but uh, the only day that I uh, recall is July sixth. Is we have to publish or submit the session before then, right? So right. I can start a draft, and we'll come up with some you know things to discuss, and I'll base it on the white paper outline. Exactly. And let's get that submitted and then we can decide. I think we have some flexibility to change a few details, but they want to know like the who's going to be on the session. There's some rules for diversity and participation and things like that for panel sessions because they don't want like four people from one company, for example, or right. things like that. Right? Or they don't want like all male panels or uh, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. We'll have to just abide by, which is great. And then uh, we can, you know, figure out the content details. Well, I, I certainly would welcome anyone who's participating on this who feels they have a, a perspective to add um, to, to join the panel. And then I think, you know, if we have to find diversity of vendors or, or open source projects, we can certainly raise the flag and right. CNCF tag and SIG security Kubernetes to, to invite others who, because you know, especially if they directly match the outline of the white paper. So if anyone wants to submit uh, nominations or nominate themselves, um, feel free to, uh, where, where's the best place to drop that, Jim? You think in the Google yeah. Drive or the? Yeah, just on Slack or Google Slack. either okay. way, right? So yeah, Slack will be fine. All right, I think that's all we had for today. Uh, Anything just, else? Yeah, just one call, call to action or invite to action. Um, I'll post the, the Slack channel. I did create a breakout channel in the CNCF Slack on public sector topics because we were just having a lot on the CNCF tag around those of us who are deeply involved in public sector. And, and I would invite those who are international. I mean, EU and, and, and Asia Pacific have similar uh, government requirements and policies and whatnot. But um, so it would be more expansive than just policy. But if those of us who have a public sector view of things want to uh, trade notes, and and you know uh, related to that, you know Anka might be interested. To you you know as I'm trying to reach out to um, obviously the FedRAMP folks who I work with closely on a lot of projects, but even now there's an effort to do state ramp and Oscal. I was just having an email thread with them today. So state ramp is like the 50 states adopting FedRAMP and, you know, tweaking it slightly to make it more fun. Uh, but, you know, asking them what their plans for OSCAL are and, and hoping that uh, we can get uh, CNCF and Kubernetes involved in their working group. So anyone who's interested, I'll, I'll post the, I don't have it at my fingertips, but I'll post the Slack channel. Uh, onto are the you talking to Dave in, uh, in OSCAL? Uh, there, there's no scheduled call today, no. There's uh, I know, I saw the email exchange. Uh, maybe I'm missing it. Maybe I haven't seen that. Okay, sorry. You just mentioned an email exchange. Sorry. <laughs> oh, no. no. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, I had a one-on-one -on -one email exchange with their OSCAL contact at the, the state ramp program. So we're going to... Okay. Uh, th that will evolve, and we're going to try to get on their count, their working group calendar. So yeah. Do you have I my have... Uh, email address, Robert, to keep me on the loop? Uh, I, I think I do, but I'll, I'll email you. If, uh, or if I don't, I'll, uh, I'll ping you on Slack. Okay, perfect. Uh, but but I'll, I'll, I'll post the information on that progress to the federal channel on Slack that, or public sector channel, and then anybody can, can, can participate. Definitely want it to be open and inclusive.
yeah, yeah. We, we work closely with them, so I would be interested if the, the uh, SSP, the system security plan, uh, makes it to the level that you just mentioned. I sure hope so. That was that was my question to them on they had their introductory webinar and that was the first question I asked. They they conspicuously did not answer it. Uh, they did send out a follow up email to everyone and, <laughs> and said it's on their list. And then they reached out to me directly and said that they are uh, they have a working group. So good, all good signs, but uh, definitely it's you know it's a work mm -hmm. in progress it seems. And CNCF is looking into the compliance as well. I thought is they are mainly on security. Uh, side. No, I mean, uh, Chris had a good, well, I guess from the Linux Foundation perspective, Chris had a good response to the executive order. Uh, there are a couple of blog posts. I mean, you know, compliance and security, Okay. they're, okay. they're orthogonal, but, you know, obviously highly coupled. So. Okay. Okay. Thank you. That's, that's it. Um, All right. I, Thanks, uh, everyone. Or, yeah. Sorry, go ahead, Jaya. You were uh, one last thing. A couple of things. One is um, I'm definitely interested in that panel that you mentioned, and second is um, the uh, so Jim and I are going to be talking tomorrow in the open cluster management upstream community about uh, our white paper and also the overall policy work group just to socialize there. Um, so I look forward to working with you on uh, getting ready for that one, Jim. Thanks. Sounds good. That's it for me. Okay. All right, then. Thanks, everyone. Bye -bye. Take care. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Bye. Thanks everyone.